Welcome to a special keynote webinar with Museums Are Not Neutral co-producers, LaTanya S. Autry and Mike Morawski. Brought to you by the Western Museums Association in partnership with the British Columbia Museum Association. I am Jason B. Jones, Executive Director of the Western Museums Association. My pronouns are he, him. My visual description is that I am a pale skinned man with short red hair and a close cropped red beard. I'm wearing a white button down shirt and sitting in a room with yellow walls that have framed artwork hung on them. Please welcome my counterpart from the British Columbia Museums Association, Ryan Hunt. Thank you, Jason. My name is Ryan Hunt and I am the executive director of the BC Museums Association. My pronouns are he, him. My visual description is that I am a white man with medium length brown hair and brown facial hair. I am wearing an orange blazer, a black museums are not neutral shirt, and a pin that says every child matters. Behind me is some artwork and a paper mache owl, the unofficial mascot of the BCMA. Thank you, Ryan. In this era of virtual meetings, when digital spaces may substitute for our physical sense of place, it's important to reflect on the land we each occupy and honor the indigenous people who have called it home. I'm speaking to you from Tulsa, Oklahoma, within the boundaries of the Muscogee Creek Nation, who were forcibly removed here from their traditional territory. Wherever we are each located, let us acknowledge all indigenous nations as living communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We at the Western Museums Association and British Columbia Museums Association recognize that our organizations and those of our members were founded within a colonizing society, which perpetuated the exclusion and erasures of many indigenous peoples throughout North America and beyond. We ask you to reflect on the place where you reside and work and to respect the diversity of cultures and experiences that form the richness of our world and our profession. Thank you. And now for a few notes before we introduce Latanya and Mike and dig into the content. I would like to acknowledge today's ASL interpreter whose participation is supported by the BC Arts Council and let you know that closed captioning for today's program can be accessed by clicking the closed captioning icon in the Zoom control menu. Jason? Special thanks goes to DLR Group for supporting this keynote presentation and transformative change in museums. Kathleen and Dan at DLR are great champions of WMA. We appreciate their work, the way they go about it, and most certainly we're thankful for their support of this program. The best way to continuously refine our craft is to listen to our attendees. So we ask you, uh, sorry, we ask that you share your candid feedback with us. Following today's program, those who signed up through Zoom will be sent a link to a, satisf to a satisfaction survey. Sharing your experience through the survey will only take a minute and will greatly improve our work. We encourage you to participate in a dialogue with your colleagues during this program through the chat feature. However, we will not have traditional Q&A following this presentation, so the Q&A feature has been turned off. Instead, after their presentation, Latanya and Mike will turn the tables and ask a few questions for you, so make sure to stick around for a Museums Are Not Neutral call to action. Please follow the BCMA and WMA on social media to be aware of future programs. Links will be posted in the chat. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers, Latanya S. Autry and Mike Morawski. As a cultural organizer in the visual arts, Latanya centers her curatorial practice on collective care. Latanya co-created The Art of Black Descent, an interactive program that both promotes public discussion about the Black liberation struggle and encourages fighting anti-Blackness through public art interventions. Her latest project, the Black Liberation Center, is an ex experimental series of exhibitions, workshops, and programs that spotlights arts and culture 
that envisions and strategizes paths and therefore, and strategizes paths towards the freedom of black people and therefore for all people. As a museum consultant, change leader and educator, Mike Morawski is passionate about transforming museums, cultural institutions and nonprofits to become more equitable and community centered. After more than 20 years of working in education and museums, Mike brings his personal core values of deep listening, collective care and healing practice into the work that he leads within organizations and communities. Since 2001, he has served as the founding editor of Art Museum Teaching, a collaborative online forum reflecting on critical issues in museums. Mike's new book entitled Museums as Agents of Change, a guide to becoming a change maker is now available through Roland and Littlefield Publishers. With that, let's begin. Mike and Latanya, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for the warm um, welcoming. Um, it's wonderful to be with all of you today. I'm Latanya Autry and my pronouns are she, her. I am a medium brown skinned black woman with big hair. I'm the descendant of enslaved people living on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Erie and Haudenosaunee people in the area that is at the moment known as Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I am wearing a black t-shirt that says abolish white supremacy and long um, yellow beaded earrings. Well, uh, and my name is uh, Mike Moraski and my pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I'm joining you from uh, what we call today Portland, Oregon, on the traditional homelands of the Multnomah, the Oregon City, Tumwater, Watlala, Clackamas, Chinook, and Tualatin, Kalapuya peoples. Um, and I'm a um, middle-aged white male with really short brown hair, uh, my COVID cut, uh, wearing a black t-shirt with um, six fist emojis on it. It's a shirt designed by Clinkett artist Allison Bremner. Um, and I'm in a um, space with a, with a gray wall behind me. Part of it is brick, part not, and some pictures and uh, uh, a shelf behind me. And just really, really um, honored to be able to, to be here and to be able to speak uh, with Latanya about our work, our, our practice, our questions, <laughs> and, uh, and some of the things that we've been thinking about um, through this ongoing Museums Are Not Neutral initiative and movement. Why don't I go ahead and jump into sort of a little bit about um, kind of where, kind of how Museums Are Not Neutral got started in a very quick summary of kind of what it's been. Um, and then um, we're gonna move into a quote reflection. So um, let me go to the slides. Okay. Um, so museums are not neutral. Uh, Latanya and I, we, we tell this story a lot, but we were tweeting back and forth and one of us tweeted, museums are not neutral. And I think, uh, Latanya, I think you tweeted back, that would make a great t-shirt. And in one of those fateful moments, I responded, seriously, <laughs> it could be. Um, and um, boy, that was in uh, 2017. Um, August, I think it was August of 2017, we started the Museums Not Neutral uh, campaign in terms of uh, getting the message out there via t-shirts. And then we've added other things onto that um, to really support the message. But it's also been a social media hashtag campaign. And I think that's one of the really important parts of this campaign that has brought people together into um, collective thinking and action and really sharing a lot um, to help hold institutions accountable and highlight and celebrate the great practice that is happening um, within the field, but also outside of the field and bringing that into the field. Um, I, I haven't done a complete update on the stats, but I know within the first three years of the initiative, um, so almost up until now, we've gone about almost four years now, um, we sold more than 3,000 you know, shirts around the world, I think every continent except for Antarctica, and raised about $30,000 for social justice organizations and relief funds. So all of the profits go to different organizations and social um, uh, social justice groups that we work on. We um, last 
last year supported the Museum Worker Speak Relief Fund. Um, and right now the campaign is supporting seeding sovereignty and the Indigenous Impact Community Care Initiative, um, which has been really helpful um, in working with uh, Indigenous communities in New Mexico, but also even though we're getting vaccinated, the pandemic is still really having major impact on a lot of communities. So good to keep that support going. Um, and then finally, the, the online communities that have create, been created around museums are not neutral have engaged more than a million people around the world. And I think that's important to note just because when we connect and start to bring these ideas, bring people together around these ideas, there's so much change that can happen. Those numbers represent real hope and possibility for bringing people together around the change that needs to happen in museums today. Um, so with that, I'm gonna um, move over to our quote reflection. Jump in for a second. Um, I wanted to highlight that, you know, while we started the initiative in August 2017, what it's about actually has been on, you know, happened way before we came up with, you know, that particular phrase. Um, the Museums Are Not Neutral um, initiative is grounded in really important activist work that many um, artists and museum workers over decades and community members have been saying. So yes, they came up with that phrase and put it on a shirt and it became this, you know, a hashtag and a conversation, but our work is really grounded in the work of so many others before us. So one group is Museums Respond in Ferguson with Aaliyah Brown and Adrian Russell. Um, we, you know, there's so many groups that have been saying this work and you could think about activists in the late sixties, a lot of artists, that we're highlighting, you know, that museums are not these neutral spaces as well. Um, so just wanted to, you know, say that this is this has got a, a deep context. Yeah, thanks, Latanya. And yeah, we've we've sort of written about and tried to share too. There are just so many, like you said, so many different movements, individuals, um, and um, yeah, like a deep history to this idea. Um, and yeah, I think it's just, um, I'm just grateful that we're in a position to be able to amplify a lot of that work and those messages and, and sort of keep keep the fire burning, I think, in a certain extent, so. Yeah, and we've been, um, you know, with that saying, with that idea, is that Mike and I are these people that read a lot of books and surprise, surprise, if you didn't know. Um, and so we are, you know, people who are learning from other folks. And one of the things that we've been doing in this boot camp thing that we just started um, in the last couple month or two um, is, you know, reflecting with different scholars, artists, whoever, you know, whoever's got good material. And we've been including kind of quotes. And um, we would inc we include these kind of quotes at the beginning. And these are, you know, from people that we're reading their work and we're thinking with their their you know thoughts and ideas and trying to figure out how we can put these into action. So this quote is from a scholar, Catherine McKitterick. She is a cultural geographer. Um, this is from her a new book that she has out called Dear Science and Other Stories. Our undoing is practice, patient, and focused. This is just on page five in this book, and this really caught my attention. Um, and I think it's because, you know, I mean, really think about that. Our undoing is practice, patient, and focus. I think there are multiple ways to interpret this very short sentence. And in one day, in one way, undoing sounds, it could be really violent. Um, but undoing could also be, and while it can be violent, it could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing, but it could also be a good thing. And I think for me, um, as someone working in these institutions, having been uh, working as a curator in an art museum, it, as a black woman in white art museums, there has been this undoing has been central to my work. Um, my work has been trying to undo white supremacy in the institution, but the institution has been trying to undo me as well. <laughs> so that's really kind of caught my attention. So that's just a couple of reflections for me. What, Mike, what does this bring up to you? Yeah, well, it was great to, it's been great to have conversations now, actually with a few groups that we've met with, um, including the boot camp uh, participants around this quote, and just reflect on power. We both love to sort of pull out um, just this sort of 
when someone just gets the language so well and just such a few words and you know just a few words like this but yeah and that idea of undoing to me also connects with this idea of unlearning and it make it turns it into like it's more honest about that challenging process of unlearning that we have to go through but then i love that that sort of is juxtaposed with this practiced patient and focused almost like meditating on this challenge of like undoing unlearning um and yeah that has been it's been such a deep idea throughout having conversations about museum practice i think yeah um yeah you hit it right there it's this part to really remember about the practice patient and focus it's something like i'm trying to think with this every day if i can remember i should put it on the um I should put it on a post-it and put it on the on the mirror in the in the bathroom or something because I need to really think with this a lot um, because this is it's always an urgent time but I don't know it feels like lately in the last few weeks or month or so what you know or a year I don't know we could just keep going um, there have been a lot of really bad things that keep we keep hearing about in the news and we know about. But the, the reality is they always have been with us. Like, yeah, you know, so part of me is just going, God, is it getting worse? But maybe it's, just, it's not getting worse. It's just, this is, this is what we're in. We are all in a really urgent time. Um, you know, Mike, I don't know if you could go to that next, my next slide. I've, I've been feeling like in the last couple of weeks or so, I don't even know what to focus on because it, it there's like 40 horrible things going on and you know doing this work this activist work and museums are tied into all of this stuff and it's the museums it's the universities you know these kind of systems um and and you know then hearing about these these first nation these children you know or they were abducted and put in these residential schools um tortured murdered <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's too much. And um, it's it's really horrific. And then, you know, what I I know that some of us know about, you know, the, the move bombing that happened in 85. Well, in April, it kind of came out in the news that, um, so what had happened in 85 is the city of Philadelphia had bombed a black activist group, bombed their residents and murdered six adults and I think eight children. Um, yeah, let me look at my number six six adults and five children excuse me when the bomb like it killed it killed these people and then to make matters worse they gave the remains of some of the children to a museum to um pym museum to anthropologists there and they've had these 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 children tree and delicia africa they've had their remains for you know, decades, like 36 years or something. So this just came out in April about this. And it's like a nightmare horror show. And then it just keeps unfolding that they possibly have more remains and the, you know, Penn Museum is part of UPenn and the remains were shuttled back and forth to Princeton. Um, uh, anthropologist there was making course videos with these children's bodies and smiling and videos. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, when you, you hear about it, you go, what? But the reality is they've always been doing that. And that's what a lot of people have always known about these institutions is that how they are wrapped up in violence and how they are killing us. Um, lot, you know, a lot of people have known that and they've been saying that indigenous folks, um, black folks, right? And I think for some people you think, oh, that happened a long time ago. It's happening right now, it happens every day. This is a quote from a, um, there was a, a discussion on um, Black News Service, B, B, what is it called? BNC, yeah, BNC. And um, Mark Lamont Hill, Dr. Mark Lamont Hill was in conversation with Dr. Crystal Strong and um, Mike Africa, who was one of the children that was able to survive that horrible bombing in 85. So now he's you know, a grown man and he's finding out about his siblings. Um, and he's been you know pushing for something, you know, they. It's just horrible. Like, what do you, you know, what do we get? So Mark Lamont Hill had like, kind of said in this video, and you can watch this on YouTube, really, you should watch the whole conversation, but this is a part that I really wanted to highlight. 
And I've been thinking about it for weeks and I haven't even talked about it hardly, but I just keep going back to it pretty much every other day. So he said, can these instances push us to reimagine the role of the discipline of anthropology, the role of the university in reinforcing this? As Mike said, these are children, these are people, someone loved them. And Dr. Crystal Strong responded, I think it more than prompts us to reimagine, it requires us to reimagine. If the foundation of scientific knowledge is an extension of state violence, the abuse of black and brown and poor and indigenous bodies, indigenous people, then that means police are not the only thing we need to abolish. Perhaps we need to abolish scientific knowledge as we know it, that we need to think about what kind of university must exist if it must exist. What kind of knowledge must exist in order for us to number one, as MOVE has taught us to see life as the priority, to see respect as the priority, to see an ethical praxis as the priority. So to bring it back to the beginning, it requires that there, it requires there's a moral and ethical and political imperative to fundamentally rethink and transform the university itself. For me, that was kind of everything and it meant it's about the museum, okay, people? We could just put the word museum in there too. We could throw that in there. How are we all like knowing about all of these abuses in these museums and then just going, okay, well, anyway, we'll worry about that later because right now we need to get back to normal. The normal is, it is a horror show. It's right now that we need to do something else right now. We need to reimagine. Um, so yeah, I, w I really wanted to highlight this and I do hope you, you do, you know, look at the MOVE Families press conference, um, you know, go back and, you know, look at these, these stories, you know, read this whole, you know, discussion. Um, yeah, all of these things. I, I know, Mike, you have some thoughts here too. Yeah, no, I, this is a really powerful, I think, example in case to bring up what what we did talk about in the you know uh, museums are not neutral boot camp with everyone kind of the first the first session and we've continued to really think together a lot about the the urgent need for uh for this ethical grounding that seems missing and this is this is a very um you know maybe a um a, a larger case of that, but I think one of the, but it's happening, like you said, it's happening everywhere. It's happening kind of all the time and it's happening in big and small ways and slippery ways. Um, and I think, you know, the, these quotes are just so powerful because I think it's this idea that we have a responsibility, a moral and ethical responsibility to rethink what we're doing, to rethink these institutions and the policies and practices. And I think we're really on a, a knife's edge right now in terms of museum change. Um, and, you know, are we going to confront, you know, a lot of this or are we going to just continue kind of going down the road of the status quo? Um, and when and the, the idea of self-inquiry really came into this um, has been really central to sort of take a step back and go through self-examination, because before we can dive into, I think, some of this ugliness in museums, we've got to dive into the messiness that's happening within ourselves as individuals. So there's this really, I think, clear demand for self-examination. And I love this word, reckoning. And you brought that into the conversation too, a reckoning with the role that we play um, in the current system and the sort of value gap that exists. Um, and, and I think the last thing that I would say is like the, the concerning value gap that exists in, in this case, but I think, you know, over the last year, especially we've just museum may put out this wonderful equity message or statement of solidarity with Black Lives Matter and, you know, communities of color. Um, but at the exact same time, the internal realities at that museum are toxic, harmful, oppressive workplace cultures. And so, you know, four months later, you've got you know, because of the, that situation. So there's a huge gap between there. And I think that needs to be addressed. Um, and I think a lot of the, there are definitely people that work for museums whose personal values, if you really dig down and start to explore what you what matters and what you stand for, those values don't align with the institution's values and practice. And I think those are some really big issues that need to be addressed and we need to explore and, and sort of deal with them. 
Yeah, you're definitely um, you're definitely hitting at hitting at these. You know what the real issue is is there's often a real disconnect between us as individuals. But I often, you know, what I've been asking people is like, what do you, what are you about? <laughs> like, and I have found, um, you know, some people know what they're about. They know, you know, what they believe in. Some people seem like they don't, and they are just following whatever the leadership at the institution says. They'll just go with it, and that is actually how we see a lot of. Um, the ongoing violence in these institutions, how it happens, is that people just go with whatever the established um, patterns have been, and we're all falling in line with it without, you know, questioning it, and often just questioning ourselves, like, what are we about, and how do we bring that to our work? So it's a lot of what the boot camp is trying to do is first to get us to, as individuals, do that work of identifying what's important to us and then think about, like you said, um, the institutions, there's what they say they're about, the rhetoric, right? And then there's the actual walk, like what the actions are. Um, and we're looking at how those things, you know, typically don't, don't align. One of the questions I've been asking people a lot is, you know, what sustains your work? What, what are your frameworks? Like what we're highlighting is different, you know, books, uh, thinkers, artists, activists that, are meaningful to us and would have shaped us. And, you know, what I do in my work is if I find these things that, you know, are some kind of way sustaining me, I really try to live those things. They are really core to me and I live them out in my work. So my work is actually what I consider praxis. The point of it is it's action with, um, you know, reflection and it's about changing the world. That's what praxis is. And, you know, I ask people who are co-workers, what are you about? What, who are you working with and for? Um, and when people can't answer that, except for to say, well, I just, you know, this is my boss's name. That's a problem. That's a problem. And that's a problem in our field in general in museums. And um, uh, Mike, did you want to share a little bit here about, I know you have this seven homecoming. Yeah, I can. And hopefully my audio is working okay. I looked like it was a little glitchy before, and I'm sorry about that. Yeah, hopefully it seems like it's working. Um, yeah, and this was a, this was a um, so we went through in the in the virtual boot camp for museums are not neutral. We went through some exercises just to explore, um, you know, explore some of these ideas of self inquiry. And I think it's good to just develop a practice. One of the ones that I think can be it's really meaningful. It comes from one of those resources that has made a big difference for me this last year. And it's a book by Lama Rod Owens. I've got it up here on the screen uh, called Love and Rage. And I'll share it um, a little bit later in the presentation with the resource share that we're gonna do. <clears throat> but it's this idea of a seven homecomings meditation. I really like it because it, asks, it invites you to really meditate and reflect on your circles of care and support. And, and Latanya, it's a lot of the things that you kind of just mentioned, this idea of teachers, mentors, and elders who have guided you. Spend some time reflecting on the the books and texts that have deepened your wisdom for you in this work and on this path. Um, and then, you know, what are those communities where you feel supported and feel cared for? Um, connecting with the earth and the land is an important part of sort of this connection. Um, Lama uh, Radawans brings in silence and then also connecting with yourself. And so I think these ideas is one practice um, that I think is really interesting to sort of, again, just get grounded and be grounded on a regular basis um, with who we are and how we want to bring ourselves into our museum practice. Um, yeah, and I always just think like, what would these institutions look like if if people were doing this on a regular basis? How would all these things be different? And I'd like to think, and I maybe I have radical hope that it would be very different if we grounded ourselves in different ways. Yeah, I, I think so. Also, I think we probably just need very different people in leadership roles. <laughs> I'm just gonna say that. Um, we probably need very different folks. Um, leading our institutions, because some of that, that's never going to work for them. Um, one thing I, I wanted to say is um, just a, a technical thing. Did you see in the comments, Mike, someone said, if you turn your video off. Um, oh, yeah, sure. 
yeah, yeah that might help with um when you're screen sharing because cool. um, okay. we've been kind of having that but yeah you know one of the things that i will say even with when you have these ideas that you know we we feel like are very um are centering us sometimes i found myself what i, I would call being unmoored because i i would keep you know keep learning the, the point is you don't just learn something at one point and you're done you keep learning and you realize oh this thing that i thought you know was holding me up is problematic or it doesn't work or you know whatever it hurts <laughs> it's hurting other people and i've come to this point where i've been like oh i really need to question some of this and i think a lot of us who um, are working in these institutions um, we haven't asked ourselves a question like how are the institutions and we as individuals how are we complacent how are we complicit in upholding anti-blackness and colonialism and this this is a question that's actually in this really fabulous book called toward what justice um toward what justice it's edited by eve tuck and k wayne yang um this is an adaptation of that of that question but yeah this is the kind of thing that we're we're encouraging us to really think about how are we complacent and complicit in upholding anti-blackness and colonialism i mean really you know thinking about the museum field as a whole thinking about institutions that you work in or have worked in really you know deal deal with that question i think you will find your a lot of tension um once we get here. Yeah, and I think this, um, this, yeah, this question, Latanya, you and I were talking recently about, you know, just Canada has this truth and reconciliation commission and process and in the US, we just haven't got, we haven't even gotten there yet. And I think this question within our field of museums really asks for, for both. It asks for us to really recognize and deal with in an honest way, the truth um, of what a lot of institutions have really upheld and been about since their founding. But also at the same time, I think there's, you know, kind of this process of reconciliation and healing that's desperately needed too. But, but we're not going to get there <laughs> unless, unless we sort of deal with this stuff. And that's, I think, some, you know, just some of the most frustrating things. I think this question has been powerful in our conversations, um, you know, and through different sort of workshops and programs. Uh, I also find that it's this, and I, I think I've even added yellow to the we as individuals, because it's really easy to point out those people are doing this thing, but it's way harder, but almost it's really necessary that we point out our role in these systems. Um, and I think that is a big moment that needs to happen in a lot of cases and just allow for the vulnerability for that to happen. Um, and I think in some cases, you know, if we, you know, start having these conversations within institutions, then all of a sudden, you know, the blame is placed on us and we can't have these open and honest conversations um, about, you know, individual complacency within these horribly oppressive systems. Um, so yeah, I think this this question, I'm glad that you, you pulled it out because I think it's a really, really powerful one and one worth reflecting on pretty much just constantly. <laughs> right, and you know, our institutions are made up of people right they they are made up of people they're made up of individuals so um yeah like it's it's a question to keep thinking with it's a question i actually used in a show that i curated last year i don't think anybody at the institution where i work <laughs> answered the question um and i didn't hear too many people actually really engage with it but i could just keep bringing it back it's something else i wanted to say is that um you know these truth and reconciliation processes that have happened in some places, not in the US on any kind of deep, broad scale, but also they're problematic also, right? They also have lots of issues. And I know um, various First Nation scholars have highlighted the, the problems of that. And one thing about like, we're not even gonna be reconciling if we didn't have a relationship in the first place. Um, that is something I read in uh, Leanne Batasmasaki Simpson's um, scholarship there's a book called as we have always done and she talks about the, the problematic nature of um canada's for truth um truth and reconciliation process what it what are the assumptions that are already built into that in the first place so yeah a lot of work to be done <laughs> <laughs>
Well, that's why it's good. You know, one of the things that you that we've talked about since the very beginning of Museums Are Not Neutral is there's a lot of talk happening, but not a lot of action. And so we, you know, obviously are constantly advocating for and demanding actions be taken, like real things, real steps moving forward. So we want to kind of highlight and kind of it's going to be brief because we could certainly do a whole separate presentation on, you know, some of the actions that we'd like to highlight. But over the years, we've sort of developed um, you know, for lack of a better term, like an action manifesto. Um, and again, it's evolving and changing. And, you know, we keep recognizing too that the language is changing because as soon as we start <laughs> getting some language together to, you know, push an advanced change, a lot of the times language is getting co-opted and it just becomes meaningless. And then we have to find new language to describe um, what we're talking about. But this is a set of actions and we can we can highlight a few of them and go over them all, but um, I think these are this this would be a good start, right? <laughs> For us to start tackling a lot of these things um, here. I might just because I want to make sure we read through all of these even just really quickly. I might just read the first few, Latanya, and then if you wanna um, sure. or if we wanna comment as we go, I'm not sure. But I think um, one of the ones the the bolded ones we sort of pulled out. And the first one of those is create and seek out spaces for collective action and solidarity. I mean, that's that's huge, and I think big, and part of what I think our initiative is really uh, focusing on. Um, what, what, did, what did you want to comment about that one before we move down the list? Yeah, it's you know, it's about knowing who you got to figure out who you can work with. Um, you really have to be thinking about who are you in dialogue with and who can you work with. So. You can't do that everywhere, but this whole thing about collective action and solidarity, really important. You can do a lot of important work as an individual, but I'm gonna say big, but but um, you could take some of the stress off of yourself if you can work with other people. And so, yeah, find, find people you can work with, build coalitions. Yeah, and we've addressed this idea of community accountability. We don't have time to go into that more here, but I think just, you know, allowing communities to, accountability isn't just on us, it should be a, a much broader responsibility. So I think broadening that as much as possible is super important as we're addressing these urgent changes, this need in museums. Um, there have been a lot of exceptional work around getting more awareness around um, pay, pay inequities, salary transparency issues, and labor, um, you know, issues of labor in museums. So that, but that is still key. We wanted to make sure we reiterated that as well as, um, you know, cannot uh, say enough about the importance of organ staff organizing and unionizing. And this last year and a little bit beyond that has been so key to see staff at museums unionize and come together. Um, and unfortunately still see leadership resist it. Um, and so I think it's key for institutions to be supporting of staff that are getting together and trying to advocate for themselves. We should all be in this together and doing this um, to support staff at all levels of the institution. And we have on here reform and change the hiring practices. You know, this <laughs> these should be standard that pe people know this. And I think, you know, also wanna highlight so this stuff has been, a lot of it has been said, you know, it's been said for a long time, um, but the people who are in positions of power continue to ignore and disavow all of the scholarship that's already been out there. You know, Por Dr. Portia Moore has a wonderful article. Uh, I can't remember the exact title, but it's about these cartographies where she's talking about all these maps that have already been um, written. <laughs> and so they're out there and they think it ties to this rethink and replace our organizational hierarchies and leadership structures. Um, you know, yeah. Things aren't changing. It's There's a reason why the things aren't changing. We still have the same kind of hierarchies and, you know, these structures of leadership. We have the, the often museums follow kind of a corporate model, um, you know, and then go around saying they're about equity doesn't make any sense. So it has, you know, this kind of pyramidal structure with one person at the top and all of these other people under them that are automatically not about equity. I mean, people have talked about this, you know, people who are in these other positions that have written really important articles that keep being ignored. So um, there is, the, you know, just look at what things stay the same and which things do they offer the people who are in these top level positions. There's, there's a reason why the problems have remained for decades, 100 years. 
Yeah, and I think it's important around this idea of leadership structures. Um, I have had a lot of conversations this last year with individuals who, you know, again, uh, and I saw some people in the chat too, you know, our organization's replacing our executive director. What can we do? And my first recommendation is rethink the role. Don't have an executive director, have co-directors, have, you know, rethink leadership because there are organizations that are rethinking those structures and it's working really well. It's actually allowing them to focus on, again, these think about the values is having one person at the top with a, with a bunch of power and authority. Is that reflecting the values that you want to be having? Um, and if you're, you know, if you're for equity, is that structure, you know, going to align with that? And it just doesn't, it's a very outdated structure and there's so much research out there on it. Um, and, and there are museums making that shift and we need to celebrate those and draw more attention to those. And I'm happy to do that in another forum and <laughs> not take up too much time here, but they exist. Don't be afraid to, to take that leap um, and dive into this area of replacing these structures. And we've also highlighted, you know, really making mean meaningful reforms at the board level. Another very important conversation that's like at least an hour long, two hours long conversation about the board structures, but yes, there are ways to reform that. Prioritizing equity in the budgeting. And I know, Mike, I think you added in here about budget is a moral document. Like, hello, people. <laughs> Put your money where your mouth is. Like, they're always saying all this stuff about equity and yada, yada. But how is that actually playing out in terms of where they're, you know, where how the money is being um, allocated? And I know we didn't put this as a highlight to go into this in detail, but it's just so important to pay attention to money. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, and if you're, you know, if you're at an organization and someone says, you know, oh, we applied for this grant to do equity work and we'll have to wait to hear back, like that means you're just not prioritizing it. It is not a priority at your institution. It is not, a, it is not valued because if it was, you would budget for it from the baseline. Um, and there is a, um, gosh, one institution that I will highlight um, and I know I highlight this institution a lot, is the Five Oaks Museum here in uh, the Portland, Oregon area. Um, they are transforming a lot, but one of the things they did that I think is really amazing is value-based budgeting, and they shared it on Instagram, so transparency. I thought that was just brilliant, and I would love to see, there are other institutions that are really trying to tackle this idea of equity and budgeting, participatory budgeting, values-based budgeting, um, bravo, and, and I wanna see more institutions uh, getting out there and trying that. Um, and that, you know, connects to this last uh, action step that we have that we, Latanya, you and I have both kind of dug into this, um, especially in a separate presentation at the Memphis Art and Design Week called Arts Funding is Not Neutral. <laughs> like taking the step to critically examine these funding structures and how philanthropy operates. Um, and I think not relying on sort of the status quo of, of how this all works. Yep, that's a, a very important conversation. And again, we don't have enough time to go into it in detail, but we are actually gonna kind of touch on it, I think a little bit later in our in our questions to you section. But um, I think we should move on because we're kind of unfortunately running out of time here. Yeah, we can do a resource share really quick. And yeah, we will have to do chapter two of our <laughs> presentation some other time. Um, I'll really quick just, you know, and if you, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll share this presentation, the video and all this will be available afterwards, but you can take a screenshot. I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, but again, we just, just books, again, none of these, I'm looking through the list, none of these are museum books. So reading things that are about, you know, spiritual practice, social justice practice, transformative justice, uh, or, and restorative justice, um, thinking uh, things about like nonviolence, uh, leadership, indigenous knowledge, um, and Buddhist spirituality. Like these are things that are really important and can change the way we perceive the work that we're doing. So I, you know, recommend a lot of these resources because, and, and find your own. Um, that can really tap into ideas that are core to you. Um, let me move over to your resource list, Latanya, because you're you're like the the superstar of like gathering amazing readings resources and, and leading those discussions. Yeah, I'm kind of um, yeah, <laughs> I'm stuck on on this, but it's it's true. I really do try to to I find things and I try to live them in my life um, completely. And yeah, a lot of important uh, thinkers. And you know, I really think of my work, like one of the key people that I think 
I'm trying to model my work as a curator is working with like Ida B. Wells, um, this very important um, human rights activist from like late 19th, early 20th century, um, who was fighting lynching in this country. From the beginning, she has been central to my work as a, as a curator. So um, yeah, crusade for justice. Um, and thinking with, you know, people who really, they've, they're focused on who their community is and it's very much this, it's a, a practice that it's in their life for, you know, decades and they're really working with their community. That's the kind of work that I find, um, you know, just gives me life that's sustenance in, in my life. And I also wanna highlight in here, it's so it's thinkers, it's activists, it's artists and thinking with a certain even objects um, in a way. So one of them is just this red carpet here by, by Moana Numatello and Kyle Gowen. Um, they are um, members of Decolonize This Place and, and other, you know, activists, important activist groups. But this, this object, just encountering it back in 2016, it stayed with me for years and I continue to think about it. You know, they start off with, we begin the day. Yeah, this is the, yeah, we can go into all of this, but we don't have time, so let's move on. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so we'll, let's go into the sort of question section and, uh, you know, right, you gotta, uh, what, what's the one thing? I learned this uh, from a youth workshop that a community organizer here in Portland uh, named Teresa Rayford that I have like enormous amounts of respect for um, and an honor that I was able to, been able to work with her um, and partnering at the museum um, said, question everything. Um, and so I think one of the things that we wanted to question was, question and answer. Um, how do we, you know, sometimes this Q&A sort of um, set up, the standard traditional Q&A set up, uh, just it kind of turns this weird power dynamic um, on, on speakers and people presenting. And it also pretends that like we have this knowledge and people ask questions of us when really it's about collective learning and it's about learning together. But we also thought <clears throat> like, instead of people asking us questions that we would just, we have questions. <laughs> we have questions for the field, for museums, for people in institutions um, that can make this change happen. So we wanted to share uh, a series of questions and I think we'll, we have a lot of them. We'll go through them rather quickly and maybe make a few comments on them as we go. Um, but I think these are really um, you know, important ones to sort of reflect on and think about. Latanya, any thoughts on your end about flipping the script on Q and A? Yeah, you know, I, I I think about this a lot when I actually try to organize any kind of programs um, about Q and A because I have to say, also Q and A can be really a violent experience uh, for um, for Black folks, um, for folks of color, for Indigenous folks. Um, yeah, it can be it can be troubling and doing this stuff in the museum field, which is pretty much a very um, white field and very racist. I have experienced a lot of racism in the Q&A, okay? So um, I'm very, try to be very thoughtful about this whole experience and often don't wanna do it because of having experienced racism regularly. But yeah, we flipped the script and I'm, I'm interested in trying this out and seeing how this, this goes. All right. What, what would it take to get your organization to acknowledge wrongdoing and make amends. Yeah, I mean, really think about that. Let's let's one. Please take a screenshot of that <laughs> um, and think about it for real. Like, I mean, we really mean these seriously. What would it take? Because I think some of us know that it, they, we just can't do it. But maybe we could if we really were organizing in really deep ways, like not just with people, coworkers, but through this, you know, with the city with all your people, what would it take? And make amends, because some people think they can just write an Instagram post and they're done. Nope, amend. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> well, so this is, yeah, again, that question that we brought up before, you know, how have you been complacent, complicit and implicated in upholding colonialism and anti-blackness? Again, just it's, you know, again, can't, can't repeat that enough as a core question. Right, and here I add it implicated because I think I've been reading some new stuff. This my Michael um, Rothberg, I think is his last name, um, and it's about implicated subjects. Anyway, it's very interesting because I've been thinking about what the difference between complicit and implicated. Something to think about. 
but yes, think with this question and really, you know, this is an essay that people should be writing. Everybody who works in museums should write their own essay about that institution. Yeah, and then we flip, we've moved the question over to funders. How are funders complacent, complicit, implicated in uphold, or we didn't add implicated, but upholding colonialism and anti-blackness. And again, I think uh, obviously there's a lot of work that needs to be done on funding the money side of things and the yeah. impact of all this on, on what drives institutions to make change, to make transformation happen and, and what's driving institutions to put on the brakes and right. stop things. To, there, where there's no change. And we really got to think about this because for real, we were having conversations about trying to transform institutions and we're not talking about the money. The money really got to be central to the whole thing because um, the, whole, the whole way that institutions are funded, how they're organized, they're, they're funded and organized so that change doesn't happen. So yeah, that's a whole, that's at least a, like a, a three day workshop. And Mike, can we move on to the next one? Yeah, and this next question I, <clears throat> Yeah, so here it's thinking about which one are we on? Oops, sorry, my, my computer popped forward. Ah, okay. What is your tier plan for change? Um, this is something to ask, you know, for yourself. And then, you know, then there's stuff about institutions. But even for ourselves, I think, you know, it's one about knowing what we're about and then realizing what where we are, we're working in an institution, how that aligns, doesn't align, where are those tensions? And then what you can do about it, because you know a lot of it is without there being um, deep changes with the leadership structures, there might be like nothing that's going to change at that institution. I mean, I would say that's the most most likely, um, because the change has to be very much like about a deep collective. I think changes could happen if more people work collectively and demand it that all of us should get free, and uh, it can be very hard to get. Um, fellow staff to do that because you know there's all kinds of the entrenchment. Um, there was a really good talk earlier today about the narcissistic abuse in these museums um, that Andrea, Andrea uh, Montel de Schumann and uh, Dr. Kelly Morgan gave um, and uh, with, uh, for the Collective Liberation Conference. Hopefully you're watching that. But anyway, as individuals, we have to create our own um, plans like phases for how we're going to address things, but also how we can start to connect with some other people. You know, that, that institution, they might have, they got their blinders on where they just gonna keep driving and pushing the same way, but we have to create our own plans too. Cool, I'm gonna pop through a few questions quickly here so we can, <clears throat> looking at our time. We've got, um, yeah, who is your we? And who, I love this, who are you in relationship with? And I think Latanya, you earlier said, you know, museums are made out of people, like we're people, you know, and if we think of us as, as people-based institutions, then this idea of relationships becomes really important. Um, but yeah, when we say, when we say we, what do we mean? Yep. Um, yeah, and within this and also a lot of other things, what are the power relations? How do we investigate critically power dynamics within institutions and then outside of outside of institutions as well? So anytime, you know, as a curator, um, this is a question I added, like any type of exhibitions, programming, does it do harm? How so? Should you be doing something that harms communities because you know you feel like it's we just have to have it because whatever? Um, this is something we need to be asking ourselves as as you know people that care about other humans. If you care about your coworkers or you care about communities, I mean, I know actually a lot of people that work in these places seem like they don't. But if you're doing a work of real change and you're a person that's got an ethical center, these are kind of questions you need to be asking. Yeah, and that ethical grounding applies so strongly to a lot of this. Like if you're if there is harm being created, then you need to really reflect on that ethical grounding and those core values. 
um, how do museum institutions recognize and honor community power? Again, could be a whole nother presentation. We don't have time to dig into this idea of community power. Um, but I think just getting rid of all this talk about um, empowering communities or sharing authority with communities and stop centering museum institutions within that dynamic and start to center community. And I think this idea of community power, recognizing and honoring that is something we've got to really reflect on doing more of. Um, and uh, there's this great bell hooks quote <clears throat> of being changed by community. And I love this idea that an institution um, of all kinds of different institutions can be changed by community instead of the other way around. Yes, thank you. I was just going to throw in, please stop with that outreach thing. <laughs> please stop with that. You know, if you're really honoring community power, you don't have that idea that, you know, you're speaking, you're going to teach these people, you're going to like that power, like top down kind of thing. Um, it's more about, again, like who you're in relationship with and just recognizing, wow, these, you know, these people have knowledge. Um, they, they have goals, whatever, all kinds of things already. They're already powerful. And how can you be in a respectful, authentic relationship with, with them? And, you know, and why are you coming over there? You know, these are questions to ask. <laughs> yeah, the last two here, I think, are really uh, closely related, uh, which is who can you organize with? Where are your people? And then I'm going to flip to the last one, which is how can we build shared and collective responsibility. And this is, you know, this is a real work. Um, it's working, you know, broadly like Mike and I, we've never worked in a museum together actually, by the way, folks. <laughs> um, I think we <laughs> um, started talking through social media and then, you know, met each other at Mass Action Conference back in 2016, and then have continued to kind of build projects. And I'm pointing that out to say that it might not be the people right next to you, you know, like um, who work at your institution necessarily. That's, you know, and really think broadly and laterally, like not just certain people in your department or something. Think throughout the whole institution who you can be working with, but also think about other people, you know, in the city and other cities in the world. Um, the, you know, find, that's the way we start building as a collective and work with people in other sectors, you know, how we've been highlighting so many other thinkers, not just folks in museums, but other um, people. That's how we start building, I think, a collective power and collective responsibility and realizing that these institutions aren't just for certain people. They're supposed to be for all of us. Yeah, I think it's a really powerful kind of way to um, wrap up. And I, I, during the presentation, um, I've just been noticing there's been a constant uh, activity in the chat, which is, has been really great to see. And I've only been able to catch a few of those because um, as those of you that know that have presented, sometimes when you've got the chat and you've got slides and <laughs> your notes and everything. So <clears throat> I'm just gonna share um, my Twitter account and Latanya, it's up to you if you would like to do the same. I'm happy to, you know, again, we've got the museum room now neutral hashtag um, as well as our own kind of Twitter uh, presence. Um, happy to, to answer questions or keep conversations going or if there's you know anything that bubbled up that we missed because it was hard to keep with the chat. Um, and then yeah, happy to share slides. I know this is being recorded so it's going to be shared afterwards. Um, and I just wanted to mention that because these presentation times are short and um, these conversations are not, they're deep, they're long and they need to continue and be ongoing. Yes, thank you for that, Mike. Um, a lot of people know that I'm on Twitter and on IG as Art Stuff Matters. And yeah, you're definitely welcome to follow me. And I do, you know, I'm not going to say I'm necessarily going to respond to everything, but I do respond to um, a lot of the stuff people send me. And also, people send me some crazy stuff. Recently, somebody did. Um, but yeah, um, if you're really, you know, a person that's committed to, creating change, you know, positive change, um, and you're fighting white supremacy and colonialism in these institutions, give me a shout out. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and thank huge thanks to Ryan uh, with British Columbia Museums Association and Jason with uh, Western Museum Association for this opportunity uh, for us to have this conversation, share ideas, um, hopefully spark some thinking and action out there. And yeah, keep this message going, keep the fire burning. And uh, um, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan. 
Thank you so much, Jason and Latanya, for, for today's speak and making some time to talk about actions and reflections we can all take to try to make a difference in our sector. Um, I wanted to quickly do a bit of wrap up. Um, thank you to everyone who was able to attend today's special keynote webinar with Museums Are Not Neutral co-producers, Latanya S. Autry and Mike Morawski brought to you by the Western Museum Association and the BC Museum Association. And also special thank you for Jason at the WMA for partnering us to, to co-present this. Um, I wanted to thank Latanya and Mike once again today for their time and thank everyone who attended and participated in the chat. Um, after the session, if I could remind everyone that we would love people to complete the post-event satisfaction survey, link in the chat. Also make sure to follow the BCMA and WMA on social media. Links are also being provided in the chat. And lastly, the BCMA's 2021 virtual conference is happening each Thursday in October. Um, we're just sharing a link. Ryan, you're muted. <laughs> uh, one day I'll get used to Zoom. Um, and if you follow that link, you'll be able to get notifications about speakers, themes, and registration information. So thank you all again. And I know I'm not supposed to read the parts in brackets, but the last thing is Ryan, wave to the nice people. And I love that. So I'm going to wave to all the nice people now. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Thank you for joining us.